sky, to whom do these celestial steeds belong, when you appear to us like gods on high, what brings you here to mystify? Welcome to the Kate Valentine UFO Show at 1160 WVNJ. Before we get started, first let me wish all of our li- listeners in the tri-state area a speedy recovery from these devastating storms we have just experienced. Hopefully today's show will offer you a small break in the recovery efforts. Uh, today back with us is Frank Fischino. He is, of course, the author of Shoot Them Down and the Braxton County Monster, the cover-up of the Flatwoods Monster Revealed. And along with him is Alfred Lemberg. Alfred is a columnist for UFO Magazine and also the force behind Alien View Group blog site um, and really is an extraordinarily good writer. They're both here today to discuss this forgotten era of the 1950s air war. So welcome to the show, Frank and Alfred. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. Great, great to be back. Hey, hi, Alfred. How you doing? Just fine, and hello to you, Kate, and uh, hello to all those folks in the tri-state area that are really seeing some hard times now. Uh, I'm thinking about you. You're in my thoughts. Well, thank thank you for that, Alfred. Uh, Frank, last time you were on, we left off at Mr. Sitkowski's really terrifying experience with a nine-foot reptilian knocking on the hood of his car. Right. And, And then after that, you started to speak about Ivan Sanderson's and his invest investigations at the Sugar Creek crash. And I was wondering if you could just cover that before we got on to anything else. Well, what happened is um, shortly after the incident, Ivan Sanderson went into the area with Gray Barker. They were two of the original uh, investigators, Kate. And um, there was actually five different fellas. Uh, Eddie Schoenberger was an assistant to Sanderson. And what happened is they went up. To, these guys went up the Flatwoods. Then they combed throughout Braxton County into the different areas. And as I said on a previous show, there was actually another crash incident that took place about 15 miles away uh, from Flatwoods in uh, Braxton County. It was along the Elk River. Well, uh, this was the area where Colonel Dale Levitt uh, went with his troops. He had about 180 guys for looking for a supposed airplane crash. It was uh, said to be a small Piper Cub. In reality, it was a damaged UFO that had crashed in this area. Well, what happened is about a week after the incident, these five men went up into the Sugar Creek area, and they found uh, this particular area where the trees were leveled and knocked off along the perimeter. Well, when they went in to investigate this area, they found all type of uh, evidence. One of the pieces of evidence is uh, was this actual piece of um, white plastic material, and they found bunches of this stuff strewn out through the area. And this was the crash area. There was indentations in the ground, and you know a lot of trace evidence. Well, I'll make a long story short. What happened is when they took this white, uh, it looked plastic and was coiled up like the New Year's Eve party blowers, all coiled up. They found all this stuff. They brought it to Monsanto Chemical Company. And back in the 40s and 50s, Monsanto Chemical Company, uh, they were plastics. They dealt with plastics and synthetic uh, fabrics and whatnot. So they tested all of this stuff. Well, what happened is uh, in the long run, Ivan Sanderson found out after they had used uh, different analysis machines and they were trying to test this stuff, which was plastic in nature, and he said it looked like uh, dried up uh, snake skin. Hmm. And when it was tested, uh, uh, Sanderson said it proved to have three layers. It had an outer smooth layer, the inner uh, layer in between was rough, uh, at the central point, and then uh, it had a columnar structure. And when it was analyzed further, they found out it contained aragonite, and it was porous. And um, in Sanderson's words, he said it seemed to agree with the description of a reptile shell. And when this stuff was opened up, it was nine inches, nine and a half inches long. 
and that's what baffled Sanderson. He was a naturalist, and he said that he has never seen a, uh, a snake egg, and that's what it was referenced as. It looked like snake skin, but it was actually snake egg, nine and a half inches long, and that kind of baffled everybody. And this ties into the descriptions of what um, was talked about by George Natowski. It was like a reptilian-looking creature. And um, if, uh, Alfred, are you on the other line? Yes. Um, this this part here uh, with the reptilian, um, I go into the book a little bit deeper, and by analyzing this whole thing in my research, this falls into place with the reason that this particular reptile did not leave its uh, hovercraft device, which the Flatwoods monster was actually, when it was seen at Flatwoods on September 1252, it was described as a metallic structure that looked like a mechanical man. When Snitowski saw it, he saw this thing standing in the lower half, and it had never left the lower half of this pod probe that it was um, actually hovering around it when George Snitowski encountered it. And... Um, there's pictures on my website, flatwoodsmonster.com, and there's a lot more in my book. And I actually show an illustration, a cutaway drawing, Kate, where um, I do a bio a, a, a inside and outside look of what was actually standing in this particular craft. And the way that the lower description was described to me by Mrs. May is it flared out the lower torso area and this is the same way a snake sits when it's coiled it flares out at the bottom and then it tapers up hmm. do you understand what i mean yeah oh uh, frank I'll t i'm going to interrupt you just really quickly just to recap very quickly uh, what we're talking about if someone has not had access to last week's show uh there was a saucer flyover on washington dc both july 19th and july 26th the air force had orders to shoot them down much later in september a, a late craft came flying through the coastal ada zone it was an unknown craft it was unidentified it flew low it was in flames it was over washington dc heading west uh, it seems to have crashed somewhere in Braxton County, and there were other saucer sightings and possible other crashes around that time. That is a very brief overview, but just to catch the audience up a little bit. Yeah, and just to further couch that, uh, uh, Kate, you have to think in terms of all of this occurred during the biggest UFO flap in United States history where, as you pointed out, they're doing everything but landing yes. on the White House lawn. There's, they're certainly overflying it, right? Right. You, you put all of this together with newly minted orders to, and let's not bandy words here, shoot UFOs down. I know we're, you know, we, you know, we go on to say that if, uh, if they don't follow orders to land, you know, I mean, okay, 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 no, no, no. We wanted one. We wanted to shoot one of those things down. So, biggest UFO flap, newly minted orders to shoot UFOs down, and consequently, there you start having your your Snikowski problems, your your problems in uh, Flatwoods with uh, with uh, the May family and and all of that hoorah. Uh, that's the way you think of it. You think of it in terms of biggest thing going on, shoot them down orders crash landings in Flatwoods. And let's call it this too, Alfred. It was an air war. I mean, it was us against whatever was coming in. I mean, you know, you were a combat pilot. You know that an unknown craft flying through an ADIZ defense zone off the coast over Washington, they're going to elicit some sort of an Air Force response. There's just no way that they're not going to. And so these guys were right in your face. Uh, I'm sorry, it yes, was a war. You know, of it course. was a war. It was just like uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah, you know, you know given that uh, the data is there, that all of this really occurred. So I'm, su I'm suspecting of <laughs> yeah. my own, on my own, that all, all of this really happened. And every time you try to think of an excuse why it couldn't have happened, you just take the smallest wade in Frank Vecino's, uh book on the subject and the massive amount of of data and oh well i'll, I'll tell you it it does uh, shows 
it just shows you how this all worked out, all right? Because what you had were were servicemen flyers that were sent right up into to, right up into the teeth of all of this, mm-hmm. essentially to poke a finger in an alien eye. And some of these guys never came back. Right. They never came back. And their memory is erased from the easy to find record or they are ridiculed. Now I ask you, where is the celebration of daring the most courageous thing that this combat flyer can think of? You know? Exactly. It, 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 it just astounds me. And especially with reports of nine foot reptilians and you're going up with your little pea shooter to try to take them down, you bet you that's nerve. Uh, oh, hell, we have to take a commercial break. I'm sorry. Uh, it's Kate Valentine. I was speaking to Frank Fischino, Alfred Lemberg. We're on 1160 WVNJ. We're talking about the air wars of 1952 that resulted in the tales of the Flatwoods Monster and Bashful Billy. And we'd love to hear what you think about the Roaring Fifties. Post your thoughts now. Atlantic Coast, UFOs.com. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Cape Valentine UFO Show, 1160 WVNJ. Today, Frank and Alfred are here to tell us of the air wars of the 50s, their fallout, the cover-ups, the implications. What do you think about all this? Tell us by posting on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. And, and Frank, really, a lot of credit to you. If you had not done all that phenomenal, painstaking research for the past 20 years, this stuff would have just been buried. I mean, you're right up there with Stanton Freeman as far as researching goes. You're really excellent work. Well, it really is amazing um, how it, after it's 60 years now, this story almost got lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Because yeah. Of, of basically one ridiculous drawing that was done by a We the People sketch artist, a TV show artist, and it showed the monster, this big pumpkin-headed monster wearing a dress with arms and claws that floated. And uh, that's where the whole story started to turn. And in reality, this Flatwoods monster was actually a metallic-like structure that contained a being inside of it. Yeah, and uh, but, you know, a lot of people would have looked on it and said, yeah, you know, these people got frightened, It was, and they saw something, and it wasn't this. And then, really, credit to you that you actually went to the place, unlike some skeptics, and spoke to the people and went to the area where it happened and got a very good background on it, and that you didn't let it just at, go. At threat of physical uh, violence, I I don't hesitate to point out. Uh, did, was it really, Frank? <laughs> they didn't Say like, that again? Was that actually a threat of physical violence? They didn't like you? <laughs> uh, at the beginning, I, I wasn't too well liked up in the area. I see, I see. And, <laughs> and at first, I took offense to it. Uh-huh. But after, shortly after I started speaking to Mrs. May and uh, her sons and the different people up there, um, I found out why, because the the locals up there, especially the May family and the immediate boys that were involved in this, were actually ridiculed to no end. They took a lot of flack. And that's why, at first, it was not too easy <laughs> to get, you know, information. They were basically fed up with all the ridicule over the decades and uh, the yeah. way they were portrayed, you know, as dumb hillbillies that didn't know the difference between something 12 feet tall that was made out of a metallic, like, st- it was a structure. That's what it was. It was a hovercraft and a barn owl. Well, you, you know, I had an interesting question that came in from Dale. He was wondering if the incident happened around the same time that the UFOs over Washington, D.C. were sighted on radar. And yes, obviously it did. It was like a month or two later. But I was wondering if that uh, now that craft that you mentioned in September flew through the ADIZ zone. Now, was that picked up on radar as well? Do you know? That they came in over the eastern seaboard, Kate, at a high elevation, and then once they crossed over um, land, they were they were uh, five thousand feet. Mm-hmm. and under, and back then the radar systems were only capable of tracking oh. 5,000 foot and above, so they were okay. actually flying under radar. They were picked up at certain points because they were flying erratically high and low, and they were going over mountains okay. not to crash into them, so there's your basic answer. They were flying under radar for a good portion, and back then, um, the basically the newly found ground observer corps 
system was put into effect where the eyes of the United States were focused on the sky. Um, when you throw into the mix, this was a Cold War, and the government was expecting Soviet bombers to come in yeah. and hit key cities throughout the United States. Um, the Air Defense Command had its hands full, and as Alfred has said quite a few times, they were spring-loaded. And they were taken off constantly. They were on, during that era of the summer of the saucers of 52, uh, there was a 24, they, they were on standby 24 hours a day, and they were scrambling all the time, Kate. And there's lots of records of this, too. This isn't some uh, far-fetched notion. Uh, we have several different uh, encounters within the 50s that are actually in Project Blue Book that have uh, encounters between UFOs and jets. Well, yeah, George Filer brought that up in the last week's Filer's Files, too, which is also a wonderful resource for you out there. Uh, th- there was a great question that came in from Doug, and I think this is the question that's on most people's mind that are not really ufologists. He said, is it the intent of the aliens to keep us earthlings from knowing of their presence? In other words, I, but what is their intent? You know, that is, I, I mean, these people that saw these so-called monsters, it didn't seem as if they were out to hurt them or to scare them, they almost seemed like they were trying to tell them, "Look, don't worry about it." Uh, you know, I, I don't. Get or at least to escape and evade, like any downed aviator would. Okay, all right. Well, what was your impression of that, Alfred? I mean, did what do you do? You have any idea what the whole intention of that was? And you know, you thought, actually, I mean, I can't even begin to speculate. Uh-huh. I, I don't want to make you know take any leaps of, of faith. Mm-hmm. If we just stay right down with the dat- uh, with the data, mm-hmm. you know, if we just stay right there, that's a story that you know. I mean, we can't make any presumptions on okay. what the al- you know what the aliens are thinking, you know, what they are, what their technology is, uh, uh, whether or not their technology can be defeated. You know, all of that's uh, extensions on our own part, attributing uh, alien behavior to aliens, but it's really human behavior in disguise. See, because we have no idea what I mean. They're aliens exactly. by definition. Exactly. All right? Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so th- I mean, the whole thing is is that if you just if you just stay right down with with uh, all the material that uh, Frank has uh, collected, uh, you see a, a story of unbelievable depth and scope and reach and and uh, potential and it's uh, it's it's just incredible and not the least of which are forgotten servicemen flyers who were launched into the teeth of this thing like uh, <laughs> it just I mean it just totally blows me away to, to, to even imagine myself sitting down there on the on the tarmac all spun up and ready to go and okay there they are you know upon takeoff take a vector uh, to zero zero seven five uh, uh, degrees and boom uh, you know they're they're fifty miles ahead of you I mean good suffering and most bara grugus thought you know jeez oh it just blows me away I know I, 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 I but look this is my take on it you got nineteen forty seven you got Kenneth Arnold a little private pilot and what was then a backwater of the country right up in Boise wherever the hell he was suddenly. His sighting is national news. Then a few weeks later, the craft crashes at Roswell. Big national news, bam, gets buried. The Air Force starts to do its quasi-investigation. That gets buried. Five years after that, you get that huge saucer invasion over Washington, D.C. It has an air war, as you just said. you got crashes on both sides. Then you have supposedly a presidential meeting with Eisenhower and whoever. So what was going on back then? I mean, that you're right. It's just going on the facts. Something well, was it's happening. A, it's certainly uh, a more, more than meets the eye. I mean, that is uh, crystal crystal clear to the point of obviousness but i've got a feeling that uh uh, for the rank individual on the face of this planet it would probably be a good thing all right the disclosure to find out what's going on it would be good for lay humanity to find out the only people that are damaged right now in a disclosure are the people that are presently sitting in the catbird seat and they would discover quickly that they're not sitting in the catbird seat anymore and i i think that's a large part of the problem with the uh, with the cover-ups and the disclosure and the trying to keep the truth from lay humanity yeah i I don't know it's always yeah but but still you know the truth does out eventually and i think uh frank gave it a good shove out in the <laughs> open. yeah, yeah <laughs> i think uh i think frank's given it a jado assist yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow. But so, I, so really, basically, Frank, I, I think I concluded from your books that what these people saw so uh, was really actual aliens that had uh, perhaps an escape pod of some nature and that there was a rescue mission going on at the time. Is, is that correct? I mean, is that yeah, that's what absolutely you... correct. And if, if you look on flatwoodsmonster.com, Kate, you could see the master map that I used to write the whole book. Um, it's actually a wall size map that I pieced together. It's an uh, aeronautical map. And I was able to establish 102 locations um, over 21 hours of sustained um, sightings over the United States. And it was basically all pieced together, and Flatwoods was actually uh, the end of the story. The beginning of the story is where four damaged UFOs came in over the United States. And what we were talking about a little bit earlier, it seems there was some kind of reconnaissance missions going on during that era because what I was able to establish on that night of September 1252 was the locations where the three damaged objects came over the mid-Atlantic region over the eastern seaboard. And the first object flew southwest and made a beeline and had actually penetrated into the Oak Ridge National Laboratory um, ADIZ. And that's the no-fly zone. Not supposed to do that. It flew nearly 100 miles through that area. The second object that flew in flew in the opposite direction and went northwest uh, into Ohio. It originally flew over Baltimore. And what I was able to do, and you can look on the map, I basically pinpointed all the locations, and I knew the times, the flight path trajectories, and I followed this UFO, and it went up to within a few miles of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And it wasn't a coincidence. They knew where these areas were. So there was some type of reconnaissance going on. It's not like they just knew to fly randomly to these key points. The third object came down the middle, threaded the needle, and it flew over Washington, D.C. This was the Flatwoods monster ship. What I did is I extended and I followed its flight path through the locations, and the majority of them were actually in Project Blue Book, believe it or not the UFO sightings that were reported, and it flew about 200-plus miles west, flew over Virginia, passed into Braxton County. If you look on the map, uh, Washington, D.C. is just east of Flatwoods. In other words, if you stood on the Capitol and you looked 200 miles west, you would see the hill in Flatwoods where this thing landed. So it's not a coincidence. These things had intended targets that they were flying after. And, and there were uh, people on the ground to see it, and they were able to report a direction and specific times to authorities. And I just wanted to make, make clear how uh, you were able to trace the, the, the flight path backwards. Frank. Exactly, and that's what we did. We uh, extended all of these flight paths off the East Coast, and they all intersected 90 miles off the three flight paths extended um, 90 miles into the air defense identification zone of the Atlantic Ocean, which at that point was about 200 miles east of Washington. So when these objects came in, they went in different directions. You, you know, the other thing that sort of strikes me, too, is, uh, as you said, these were traced on radar, and they knew approximately where they were landing. Was there any uh, military presence in Flatwoods or in Braxton County itself from uh, the federal military well uh colonel levitt who uh was a world war ii hero um he was in 1952 the head of the west virginia national guard mrs may knew colonel levitt and it was well known back in 52 when this incident happened kate it was estimated between the first four to six weeks there was about ten thousand people that went into flatwoods now flatwoods had a population of 300 little small community it was basically trampled to death huh. now what was well known is colonel levitt was up there the following day and subsequent weeks for crowd control because that many people and reporters were going into the area when i interviewed colonel levitt that's when i found out i actually interviewed him on two different occasions and Levitt told me that they were up there for more than crowd control. He had actually received a call from Washington, D.C., 
and he was told to go into Braxton County. It, it, he was in Braxton County to go to Sugar Creek and Flatwood. So the Air Force, when they called Colonel Levitt, they knew something was going on because you were not going to um, set out 180 troops in the National Guard to look for an owl. And that was the <laughs> official explanation. <laughs> okay. And so this uh, group yeah, of 180 the, men went Yeah, think about it, think Creek. about it. I was just going to say, you know, launching a heavy battalion, some 180 men and equipment and boats, for God's sakes, because they had to go out there and explore that river. You don't launch all of that because, you know, some kids saw a ghost in the mountains, you know? You don't think? Really? <laughs> <laughs> but we're just going to take a quick break again. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay, Valentine, I'm speaking to Frank Fischino and Alfred Lindbergh. We're on 1160 WVNJ. <laughs> They're talking about the Flatwoods Monster, the Air Wars in 1952. We want to know what you think about the Roaring Fifties. Post your thoughts now. You can always read a lot more on Frank's book, Shoot Them Down, and the Braxton County Monster. And check out Alfred Lindbergh's blog spot, blog spot, site spot, what, I'm sorry, uh, Alien View Group. Be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Kate Valentine UFO Show with Frank and Alfred. We're all on 1160 WVNJ, and we're talking about the air wars of the 50s and their implications. We'd like to know what you think about them. You can post your thoughts now, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. And uh, after the show, you can always find out a lot more on Frank's website, FlatwoodsMonster.com, or for some very interesting thoughts, go to Alfred's website, AlienViewGroup.blogspot. Um, you know, just before the break, you were talking about uh, Colonel Levitt and uh, his investigations in the area. And uh, Crystal had written in with an interesting question. She mentioned that trace evidence had been tested, and she was wondering where the physical evidence is. Did they also confiscate that? In Flatwoods, they found uh, Colonel Levitt and some of the other locals, including Ailey Stewart, Jr. He was the John Annis spot reporter that I interviewed. Uh -huh. um, they found this oily substance all over the ground. Uh, there was bits of black plastic-like material and little pieces of uh, metal. Um, Ailey Stewart, Jr. actually found a piece of metal about the size of his thumb, and he says it looked like... Uh, melted splatted solder uh, Levitt also found metal this stuff that Levitt gathered up that night he was there approximately 1.30 in the morning on September 13th and he gathered all this stuff up and he sent it back to Washington but one of the, the things when I was interviewing him, Kate, the first time I interviewed Colonel Levitt, I did not tape him I was not allowed to um, subsequently, he let me videotape him, and I stood on the farm with him for about an hour, and we talked back and forth. I held a video camera in my hand. One of the things that shocked me during our interview is when what happened is there was about 180 people over in Sugar Creek. That's where Sanderson found the uh, stuff that was uh, resembled snakeskin, the egg, the egg that stretched out gigantic, that piece. That's where Levitt was with his troops after he set the troops up there he went cross town and he went back into the flatwoods area and that's where he had approximately 50 to 60 troops and um i asked levitt how long were you up here and he was there about 45 minutes he set the troops up and then he went back into sugar creek and um i asked him how long did they did your troops stay up in Flatwoods? And he said they stayed the night. And when I responded to him, they did because that shocked me. He said, "Yeah, to see if something else was going to happen." The government wanted him to stay up there, Kate. Hmm. His troops, so they knew something had come down. We have the report of Mrs. May and a bunch of boys seeing a monster. Uh, Mrs. May told me she contacted the Sheriff's Department and the state, the state Troopers of West Virginia. They were out running around Braxton County looking for uh, what were said to be crashed airplanes and crashed objects. So when this thing came down in Flatwoods, the Air Force knew they had taken down several aircraft, 
and they didn't know what was going to happen when they went down or where they were going down. And the word reached its way back to Washington. That's why Colonel Levitt was contacted by the Air Force. They knew these things were shot. They knew they were damaged. And the government must have fell over and hit the ground when they found out <laughs> that these things all came in inland. And they knew they came inland. They just didn't know where they went down. I was able to pinpoint and track all the locations throughout the United States where all of these damaged objects went down. That's why this book took so many years to write. There were four damaged objects, which accounted for 12 crash landing sites. These were the forced down sites. When this rescue mission came in later on, there were several more landings of different UFOs, and there were different shaped objects. They were touching down, looking for the ones that went down and their occupants that were seen. So we do have a, a military-style search and rescue operation. In Flatwoods, there was a grid-type search when the objects came in to look for the flatwoods craft that was down they were combing and they were doing grid style uh searches for this object and there were other objects that went down we have another one that went down in wheeling we have one that went down in tennessee the one that went down in tennessee actually had uh emergency and uh, evac type uh personnel going into the area looking for um, a crashed airplane and when the the ambulances and the rescue crews and the fire departments all got there, there was nothing there. And that's what baffled them. What this thing had done is it had taken back off after it landed. Mm -hmm. So this was going on all night, Kate. This was not one meteor, as the government explained, a fireball meteor seen to five to six seconds that burned itself out. Wow, it, it is such a story. Uh, and to address that, Phil wrote in to say that the world was a different place back in the 50s, the early 50s. Uh, but can someone explain why we are still asking ourselves if UFOs and ETs exist? And how did this ever almost get buried with so many witnesses, so much evidence? How do you give a country in the world amnesia? Great website, Mr. Fischino. Good comment, Phil. Uh, it is amazing how people really will just take the story they're given and not look into it any further except for people like yourself. Well, when I was working with the old-timers up there years ago, most of them passed away, Kate. They kept pounding it into my head. Frank, you have to realize what the world was like in 52. Uh, no text, no cell phones, no computers, you know. Right. Especially in West Virginia, 1952, uh, the, nobody pieced it together. One hand didn't know what the other one was doing. And in the end, there was actually nine states along the eastern seaboard where there were sightings going into the, the mid-Atlantic west into West Virginia. And I was able to, through some news sources, um, to identify other areas that were within the, in, um, the newspaper articles, and I just basically connected the dots. Then I just started randomly calling libraries throughout the, the East Coast and asking them anything and everything to do with uh, what were said to be fireballs, meteors, UFOs, flaming jets. I have a list of over 100 different descriptions of what these objects were called over those 21 hours of sightings. So that's how I was able to pinpoint these areas. And then once I got a flight path trajectory going, I would just follow the line and I would call libraries in between and the following oh. location. So that's how I drew the the master map and figured this whole thing out. Well, what you also did was trace them backwards, and you found that they all came from one point. And right. that puzzled you until uh, one of the military investigators told you you have to think three-dimensionally, and it seems as if they all descended from a higher craft, hit the ocean at that point, and then spread out. Yeah, they dropped from the sky. Yeah, wow. He, he actually took the map off the wall and laid it on the floor mm -hmm. and said, Frank, you're thinking too one-dimensional. And it's like, I think we discussed this before, Kate. It's like when you see in the old World War II movies, you see the Situation Room where you see everything laid out and the guys are pushing their pieces around with the big sticks. Yeah. And uh, that's basically what we did. And that's when this fella said, you're thinking too one-dimensional, and he laid this down. He actually went into his pocket and took out three coins, and he held his hand up over the map that was laying on the ground, 
and he went one, two, three, and he dropped all these coins down, and they all landed at that one point. And, and I says, what are you getting at? He said, this is where the mothership was. Hmm. He said, and as they dis- uh, had descended out of the craft, he says, that's when our aircraft were popping them. And um, something we can probably jump into here real quick that Alfred could explain is the armaments that we had back then. Yeah. Uh, the public, uh, especially today, is not aware of what was going on. In 1952, we had the 2.75-inch Mighty Mouse rockets. And Alfred actually uh, worked in... Weren't they part of your armaments, Alfred, when you were flying? Yeah, they were. Uh, uh, just exactly that type missile, too, with the 7- to 10-pound warhead. I used 10-pound warheads, but the 7-pound uh, war- warheads would fly even quicker because there was, of course, less weight for the propellant to push to uh, uh, speeds ex- exceeding the speed of sound. But what everybody has to remember about about these particular armaments is that they would the uh, F-94s would, would salvo these munitions and once they were salvoed they just went everywhere and they covered an area essentially the size of a football field and it would be very difficult for anything to uh, get through that net especially you know when there's several several, uh, there may be several uh, jets firing these things so uh, uh, put that together with uh, encountering in in uh, in space in the atmosphere an object that, uh, you know, has uh, 10 pounds of high explosive arriving at twice the speed of sound. And <laughs> I don't know what your, what your particular armaments are all about, your countermeasures and what have you, but, man, that has got to be a big surprise in your day. And, and surprise, I think, is the operative word, I, because I think you point out, Frank, that even though they had investigated our abilities to defend ourselves, uh, this was an undisclosed ability, uh, and people... Uh, and it was sort of uh, that type of rocket fire was not known uh, at the time. It was still like a military secret. Well, the F-94 was unveiled in July of 52, oh, right, okay. at the, right at the height of the, the summer. Okay. And um, we had, the Air Force had two rocket-bearing aircraft. They had the F-86D, which was called the Sabre Dog, and they had 24 rockets. And that was actually lower, uh, in the lower body of the aircraft. And an elevator dropped down, and they would fire out from the belly area. Ooh. The Starfire had 24 rockets, and they were four uh, four groups of six rockets, and they were behind retractable doors just up in front of the nose cone area, the little rounded area in front. And the Starfire actually had uh, 1,200 pounds of electronic gear, and it had a, a computer coupled with the, the radar. And it would actually, the pilot could virtually just sit back, and just put it on automatic pilot, and the jet would fly towards the target and pick the instant and the best timing, and it would fire itself. The Navy had the F-7U-3 Cutlass, and it had a removable belly pod, and that carried 34 rockets. Hmm. So just imagine uh, a dozen jets flying at these UFOs and salvoing all of these rockets at once. It's basically like putting a bunch of... uh, little um, fireworks rockets, bottle rockets in a Coke bottle, and imagine just pointing those and shooting out hundreds of them. Yeah, like a transonic yeah, like a transonic minefield in the sky. Wow. Yeah, so that's going to be hard to uh, outmaneuver no matter who you are. And the the whole thing here with what Kate said a minute ago is the element of surprise. We were using uh, bullets at that point. So throw into this this effect here, a bunch of UFOs in the sky, and they're like, well, we're going to keep our distance because we know the drop-off and the rate and how fast they're going to go. So we could just stay out of reach. It's like in the old cartoons <laughs> with the cat and the dog chained up, the yeah, dog, right. you know, <laughs> and it can't reach it. All of a sudden, here's the UFOs out here. They know the drop-off rate of these bullets, so they could stay back a little bit further, and bang, here come these rockets flying at you, like Alfred said, the, the speed of them, they were actually um, traveled two and a half thousand feet per second. And Alfred, that's a standing position. Right, right. You add to that the uh, the speed oh, of the aircraft, and right. you know, you've uh, got something moving along pretty pretty smartly. 
Okay, well, now we know why they didn't land on the White House lawn. Okay, that explains that one. All right, this is Kate Valentine. I'm speaking to Frank Fischino, Alfred Lindbergh. We're on 1160 WVNJ. This will be our last commercial break. We'll be right back. And if you have any good thoughts about any of this stuff, post them right now. AtlanticoastUFOs.com. After the show, find out a lot more. Go to Alfred's website, alienviewgroup.blogspot, or Frank's website, flatwoodsmonster.com. Be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Kate Valentine UFO Show. Today we have Frank Fischino and Alfred Lemberg as our guests. If you have thoughts, you can post them now at AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. Uh, over the break, we had an interesting uh, question from Doug. He said, any qu- opinions why, in the middle of a rescue mission, one of the aliens decided to terrorize the people in the car mentioned earlier. I, I think this is a good point. I don't think that alien tried to terrorize them. It almost seemed like he was looking for help. Well, it was the following night, Kate. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, that's uh, the Shantowski incident was 24 hours later. Okay. That's how I was able to establish that. You know, they were basically the same type of craft that they were hovering around in. Uh, when it was seen on September 13th in Frametown, the upper portion of the suit seems to have been removed. That's what revealed this reptilian creature. Mm. I don't think you could really see. argue any terrorizing, could you? No. you know, I don't think there was any terrorizing going no. on. I think there was uh, perhaps checking for a threat or just trying to, you know, uh, self-preservation, just trying to take care of itself. I mean, terrorizing is hauling them out of the car and, you know, sticking uh, mind probes into their brains or something, you know? Oh, sure. (laughs) A la Darth Vader. (laughs) And then uh, this is a good question for you, Alfred. Rick wrote in and said, do you know what the families of the Air Force jet fighters that went missing were told? And if any of them questioned it, if any of the families questioned that story? Actually, that's a better question for Frank. Is it? Okay, sorry. Oh. Yeah, um, oh. I actually spoke to uh, to Joan's brother, and I spoke to Del Curto's brother. He was the radar operator, and uh, there was never any answers because the the aircraft was never found. Um, there was never any wreckage. There was never um, any bodies. Nothing. Um, they, the Air Force never gave an explanation what happened because it was uh, just a disappearance. And it would, they were just told they disappeared. They never gave any explanation. And this happened right at the height of when everything was starting to go on throughout the, the East Coast that, that night. Uh, the explanation that the Air Force gave was actually so lame, Kate, it was unbelievable. And there was a lot of inconsistencies. It was I go into in depth in the book, but to give you an idea, how one hand didn't know what the other one was doing in the midst of this cover-up, which happened fast and furious. There were actually three official times that the jet was said to have disappeared, which is very sad. That's just one little point to give you an idea of the scope of what we were dealing with. That would not be tolerated. That would not be tolerated in an investigation. They'd get to the bottom of that. Right. Uh, on a legitimate investigation. I yeah, on a legitimate investigation. Yeah, and it took nearly three days for the uh, next of kin to be notified, mm. which is um, ridiculous. So obviously there was a cover-up going on, because as you said, Alfred, a legitimate investigation, I mean, something actually happened, and unfortunately a, a jet did go down and someone lost their life. That is investigated, and facts are given, and uh, and something, it doesn't take three days. Yeah, to notify best it can. And to say, uh, Stanton Friedman said it the best. When I was going over this with Stanton and working with him, Stanton said, Frank, it took him uh, about three days to figure out what to tell everybody and what was going on. It was going fast and furious. And where I actually have copies of the Western Union telegrams that were sent by uh, General Chidlaw, the head of the Air Defense Command for the Air Force in 52. And... Between the telegrams, what was told to the press, and finally when the aircraft report came out, there's three different stories. So we have three different sources, three different stories, and it's abominable what was actually told to these families. 
You, you know, you also mentioned that you're continuing your investigation. Uh, what happened in 1953 and 54? Were there any follow-up flyovers, anything else that went on? Was that just really covered up, or was it sort of like a one-time uh, event? As far as the Flatwoods case, it was basically the, uh, the couple days of what happened on the 12th and then the follow-up with the Snotowski incident and the bashful belly. That was the other alien that was uh, found dead up in the Wheeling area. And But uh, I actually have another book sitting in the wings called uh, Duels of Death, and it's a follow-up book to shoot him down. And where the shoot him down book basically covered 1952, I just ran with the ball and i covered an area a time uh span from 1949 to 59 and uh, i go into the um the chases and the encounters between uh jets and planes and ufos over a 10-year area era and then i go a little bit deeper into uh europe and this stuff was going on over britain as well and there was a lot of fighter pilots british and american base fighter pilots that were disappearing and crashes going on through that era as well so it kept it was continuing key uh as far as i know nothing else has come close to this flatwoods case maybe there's other cases out there but uh this is probably the most documented case with the biggest ufo flap of 21 to 21 and a half hours of sightings yeah uh, you know, Stanton, Stanton, and Stanton Friedman has also pointed out that uh, Frank's effort uh, at uh, Flatwoods has exceeded his own effort at Roswell. <laughs> Probably, if you can has. believe that. Yeah, which is a, saying a lot, a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I was just going to run something really quick by both of you, and you can just give. And this is an opinion, and I'm sorry, Alfred, speculation, but y- you figure sometime in the '50s you get this flap and then it sort of dies down and you just got a lot of saucers flying overhead and maybe air wars and all that then it goes down it just sort of dies away then the mid 60s you start with abductions and cattle mutilations and that sort of thing and that more or less goes over then in the 80s you have all these triangles and the air force is chasing them and all that i'm wondering had it did does it almost seem to you, too, like the first wave was not so much as an invasion, but a beginning attempt at a peaceful colonization of this planet? And the second one, maybe with the abductions and so on, the mutilations, trying to figure genetically how to survive as an alien race on an alien planet. And then the 80s being a signal to just, we're here, leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. What do you think about that as a sort of a scenario? Or not? <laughs> Well, I'll, you know, I'll tell you. Well, go ahead, Frank. Um, what I what I think was going on in the late forties and early fifties, there were different races of ETs coming here, and there were definitely reconnaissance. Uh, there was a lot of sightings over strategic areas, security sensitive areas, uh, over nuclear power plants, over military bases, uh, air force stations. Uh, I mean, navy stations. Uh, there was a lot going on throughout the world, not just in the United States, but in bases in um, Europe, all over the world. The Air Force was chasing these UFOs all over the place. So they were there was a re- definitely reconnaissance going on. They were checking us out. They were seeing what was going on. Uh, on September 1252, there was reconnaissance going on as well. Uh, Operation Main Brace was just yeah. about to begin, yeah. and that actually was going into full motion. Main Brace started the following day, but the ships were dispersed out through the North Sea, and they were all going into their positions at that point. And when I brought this up to Stan Friedman, what he said to me, he says, wow, what a heck of a sight that must have been, a bunch of ETs up there checking us out and doing reconnaissance. And they say, oh, no, look at those idiots on Earth. They're starting another battle. <laughs> what it was is we were not going into war. It looked like a war. Basically, they were mock, uh, mock maneuvers. It was a mock uh, operation. But it looked like a war. And that's one point, you know, that I think is plausible. Yeah. From the air, it looked like we were going into another war, and this is just uh, about seven years after World War II. Right. So, and then you, these UFOs are seen th- over the United States that night, which ultimately turned into a search and rescue mission. Hmm. Well, Alfred, and your final opinion would be? 
Well, you know, again, uh, with regard to the amount of races that may or may not have been involved, I think uh, cutting-edge physics is going to explain that every that reality is nothing but a fractal reflection of everything else. Everything that you see is a fractal and, and an expression of a fractal. And if humanity and the the evolution of its intelligence is uh, uh, an actual occurrence, then we are proof positive then that we've got uh, more races in, in, the, uh, in the galaxy, in the universe. Because oh. what, what happens, happens. Alfred, that music sort of signifies we only have the minute left and we have to sign off. But uh, Mandelbrot would be proud of you, I'm sure. Anyway, thanks so much to both of you guys. I appreciate so much your being here. Great discussion. As always, thanks to Bill and Dave, especially Dave, who managed through all the power outages. Poor guy. Thanks to our sponsors. Mostly thank you for listening. Try to have a great week here in the tri-state area, uh, but uh, tune in next week. Thomas Reed is going to be back with Brandon Wellington of Paranormal Paparazzi, discuss his family's abductions and his experiences with the United Nations. So until next week, have a great weekend, or try to, and don't forget, keep your eye on the sky. Bye. Yes. on the White House lawn, there's, there's certainly overflying it, right? Right. You, you put all of this together with newly minted orders to, and let's not bandy words here, shoot UFOs down. I know, we're, you, know, we, you know we go on to say that if, uh, if they don't follow orders to land, you know, I mean, okay, 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 no, no, no. We wanted one. We wanted to shoot one of those things down. So biggest UFO flap, newly minted orders to shoot UFOs down,
and consequently there you start having your your Snikowski problems your your problems in uh, Flatwoods with the uh, with uh, the May family and and all of that hoorah uh that's the way you think of it you think of it in terms of biggest thing going on shoot them down orders crash landings in Flatwoods and let's call it this too Alfred it was an air war i mean it was us against whatever was coming in. I mean, you know, you were a combat pilot. You know that an unknown craft flying through an ADIZ defense zone off the coast over Washington, they're going to elicit some sort of an Air Force response. There's just no way that they're not going to. And so these guys were right in your face. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a war. It was a war. It was just like uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah, you know, given that... uh the data is there that all of this really occurred. So I'm su- I'm suspecting of yeah. my own on my own that all of, all of this really happened. And every time you try to think of an excuse why it couldn't have happened, you just take the smallest wade in Frank Vicino's uh, book on the subject and the massive amount of of data and oh well I'll, I'll tell you it it does uh, shows. The, it just shows you how this all worked out, all right? Because what you had were were servicemen flyers that were sent right up into to, right up into the metallic structure that looked like a mechanical man. When Snitowski saw it, he saw this thing standing in the lower half, and it had never left the lower half of this pod probe that it was um, actually hovering around it when George Snitowski encountered it, and. Um, there's pictures on my website, flatwoodsmonster.com, and there's a lot more in my book. And I actually show an illustration, a cutaway drawing, Kate, where um, I do a bio a, a, a inside and outside look of what was actually standing in this particular craft. And the way that the lower description was described to me by Mrs. May is it flared out, the lower torso area and this is the same way a snake sits when it's coiled it flares out at the bottom and then it tapers up Hmm. do you understand what i mean yeah Uh, frank i'm going to interrupt you just really quickly just to recap very quickly uh, what we're talking about if someone has not had access to last week's show uh there was a saucer flyover on washington dc both july 19th and july 26th the air force had orders to shoot them down much later in september a a late craft came flying through the coastal ada zone it was an unknown craft it was unidentified it flew low it was in flames it was over washington dc heading west uh, it seems to have crashed somewhere in Braxton County, and there were other saucer sightings and possible other crashes around that time. That is a very brief overview, but just to catch the audience up a little bit. Yeah, and just to further couch that, uh, uh, Kate, you have to think in terms of all of this occurred during the biggest UFO flap in United States history where, as you pointed out, they're doing everything but land. Ivan Sanderson found out after they had used uh, different analysis machines and they were trying to test this stuff, which was plastic in nature, and he said it looked like uh, dried up uh, snake skin. Hmm. And when it was tested... Uh, uh, Sanderson said it proved to have three layers. It had an outer smooth layer, the inner uh, layer in between was rough uh, at the central point, and then uh, it had a columnar structure. And when it was analyzed further, they found out it contained aragonite, and it was porous. And... um and Sanderson's words, he said, it seemed to agree with the description of a reptile shell. And when this stuff was opened up, it was nine inches, nine and a half inches long. And that's what baffled Sanderson. He was a naturalist. And he said that he has never seen a, uh, a snake egg. And that's what it was referenced as. It looked like snake skin, but it was actually snake egg, nine and a half inches long. And that kind of baffled everybody. And this ties into the descriptions of what um, was talked about by George Natowski 
it was like a reptilian looking creature and um if uh alfred are you on the other line yes um this this part here uh with the reptilian um i go into the book a little bit deeper and by analyzing this whole thing in my research this falls into place with the reason that this particular reptile did not leave its uh, hovercraft device, which the Flatwoods monster was actually, when it was seen at Flatwoods on September 1252, it was described as um, there was actually five different fellas. Uh, Eddie Schoenberger was an assistant to Sanderson, and what happened is they went up, to, these guys went up to Flatwoods. Then they combed throughout Braxton County into the different areas. And as I said on a previous show, there was actually another crash incident that took place about 15 miles away uh, from Flatwoods in uh, Braxton County. It was along the Elk River. Well, uh, this was the area where Colonel Dale Levitt uh, went with his troops. He had about 180 guys for looking for a supposed airplane crash. It was uh, said to be a small Piper Cub. In reality, it was a damaged UFO that had crashed in this area. Well, what happened is about a week after the incident, these five men went up into the Sugar Creek area, and they found uh, this particular area where the trees were leveled and knocked off along the perimeter. Well, when they went in to investigate this area, they found all type of uh, evidence. One of the pieces of evidence is uh, was this actual piece of um, white plastic material, and they found bunches of this stuff strewn out through the area, and this was the crash area. There was indentations in the ground and, you know, a lot of trace evidence. Well, I'll make a long story short. What happened is when they took this white, uh, it looked plastic, and was coiled up like the New Year's Eve party blowers, all coiled up, they found all this stuff, they brought it to Monsanto Chemical Company. And back in the uh, 40s and 50s, Monsanto Chemical Company, uh, they were plastics. They dealt with plastics and synthetic uh, fabrics and whatnot. So they tested all of this stuff. Well, what happened is, uh, in the long run... Mighty phantoms of the evening sky, to whom do these celestial steeds belong? When you appear to us like gods on high, what brings you here to mystify? Welcome to the Kate Valentine UFO Show at 1160 WVNJ. Before we get started, first let me wish all of our li- listeners in the tri-state area a speedy recovery from these devastating storms we have just experienced. Hopefully today's show will offer you a small break in the recovery efforts. Uh, today back with us is Frank Fischino. He is, of course, the author of Shoot Them Down and the Braxton County Monster, the cover-up of the Flatwoods Monster Revealed. And along with him is Alfred Lemberg. Alfred is a columnist for UFO Magazine and also the force behind Alien View Group blog site um, and really is an extraordinarily good writer. They're both here today to discuss this forgotten era of the (coughs) 1950s air war. So welcome to the show, Frank and Alfred. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. Great great to be back, Kate. Hi, Alfred. How you doing? Just fine, and hello to you, Kate, and uh, hello to all those folks in the tri-state area that are really seeing some hard times now. Uh, I'm thinking about you. You're in my thoughts. Well, thank thank you for that, Alfred. Uh, Frank, last time you were on, we left off at Mr. Sitkowski's really terrifying experience with a nine-foot reptilian knocking on the hood of his car. Right. And, and then after that, you started to speak about... Ivan Sanderson's and his invest investigations at the Sugar Creek crash. And I was wondering if you could just cover that before we got on to anything else. Well, what happened is um, shortly after the incident, Ivan Sanderson went into the area with Gray Barker. They were two of the original uh, investigators, Kate. And 